Hey there, once again, YouTube. I know it's been quite a while since I've actually put together a video, but I thought I'd put one out there. And now there's been a lot of things that have happened since my last video that I've made that I probably will not make it into this video since I do have a lot of things to talk about. But I thought I'd just make one since I had some time and it's been a while. Just want to tell you guys, remember, about my website, monitorsize.net. Again, there's a link to it in the description box below. Uh, go check that out and monitor many of the pages because sometimes I do put out a blog post and some updates on my website without doing a video on YouTube. So every now and then check back to the Yellowstone blog and especially the Steamboat Eruptions uh, webpage right here and the Hawaii blog as well. And I do have some other seismic blogs that I do post stuff on every once in a while as well. Now going to Steamboat Geyser, the recent eruption was, let's see, let's let it load. Recent eruption was the 44th eruption of 2019, which occurred at 1929 UTC on November 17th, 2019. And there it is right there, 44th eruption, guys, which is the 76th eruption since it reactivated in early 2018. Definitely the most active period for Steamboat Geyser in recorded history, that is for sure. Because if it, if, it, if it was more active in recorded history, then we would have seen more than 29 eruptions in 1964, which was the previous record. And then in 2018, Steamboat Geyser woke up and it broke the record at 32 eruptions. And now the record currently sits at 44 eruptions, but each and every eruption for the rest of the year will continue to break that record until we hit 2020. 2020 is right around the corner. I think we will reach, I think we're going to reach 51 eruptions. I believe we will reach 51 eruptions. That's definitely a record breaker for Steamboat Geyser and Norris at Yellowstone. Now here we have the most recent web recorders at isthisthingon.org slash Yellowstone for Yellowstone Caldera. Now, Yellowstone has been somewhat calm lately. It's been pretty boring, guys. I've been looking at other volcanoes and monitoring them as well, and Yellowstone, in my opinion, has been pretty boring. But we do see a swarm has started to break out here near West Thumb Lake. It looks like it's a rapid-fire swarm, but doesn't seem too major right now. But remember that sometimes these rapid-fire swarms do have precursor swarms every once in a while, where there'll be a small swarm and then a bigger one. Uh, we'll take a look at this on YLT right now, which likely is the closest seismic station to the swarm. Just from looking at the web recorders, which I don't judge to do all the time, but if you know what you're looking at, um, sometimes you can use the web recorders to kind of see which is the closest station. It's either YDD or YLT. And on here, I'm going to go for YLT right up here. I'm thinking this swarm is probably breaking out on the northern tip of West Thumb Lake in Yellowstone. So let's take a look at that in swarm right now. And here we have the most recent data from station YLT near West Thumb Lake at Yellowstone. Now, uh, right now, 627 p.m. Pacific time, November 21st, 2019. Now, throughout the day, it almost looks like there were some small earthquakes with some lower frequencies, but they aren't really showing up on surrounding stations, so I'm not quite sure what these are, and they don't really have a clear PNS wave arrival. So I'm not quite sure what those are right now. Could be low frequency earthquakes, but I don't know. Let's move on down here. Now we do see the swarm that broke out right here. Very small magnitudes. Let's keep going forward. You can tell it was a rapid fire swarm. And prior to this, we did not see these small spikes right here. Notice that. Um, those are probably little teeny, teeny, tiny earthquakes. Notice right when this first earthquake starts, we do see those teeny, I mean, micro, micro minis, guys. Very, very small quakes. And some little bit of larger ones in the mix. Probably no larger than magnitude 1.0 for those. And we see some more earthquakes. And then we see a bigger one right here. I'm going to say, let's look at the amplitude count. Can't really use the amplitude count from one station to judge a true magnitude. But I'm going to say around 1.8, 2.0, possibly. Keep going forward. We see more quakes were occurring. And we did see a few actually occur in quite rapid succession that it looks like one event. But those are multiple events blending together. Going forward. Going forward. We could see multiple events occurred right here very, very quickly. In just a matter of a minute or so, actually, right there. And going forward. More rapid fire swarming, but small magnitudes. Two quakes right here. And going forward, it looks like there really is not much. There's a tiny one right there, just barely even no noticeable. And that's pretty much it for right now. For the most recent data stream of YLT, there was a swarm, but it was quite calm. But keep an eye out for another one the next day. Might not happen, but just thought I'd put that out there just in case. 
Now, on my website, I do have that Hawaii blog that you should keep an eye out for. I'm going to start doing monthly updates for Spasmodic Tremor. Again, if you don't know what Spasmodic Tremor is in Hawaii or how it relates to the volcanic activity in Hawaii, please look in the description box below and go check that out. And I'm not like a lot of those other fringe scientists out there. I actually try to deal with facts as much as possible and not try to make too many assumptions. Um, so that should be interesting for those interested in these events. Very, very interesting spasmodic tremor, October 16th through October 31st. And even more in interesting spasmodic tremor just in the past month, actually, starting with November 1st through today, November 21st, we did see a few spasmodic tremor events. I'll get to that in just a second. The Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii continues to be at an, uh, an alert level that is raised above the normal green level. We have an advisory code, uh, code yellow, which started in July, June or July, I believe they started that. Uh, Mauna Loa volcano is not erupting, of course. The rates of deformation and seismicity have not changed significantly over the past week and remain above long-term background levels. 62 small magnitude quakes over the past week, blah, blah, blah. This was put out on November 21st. There is continued summon inflation consistent with magma supply to the volcano's shallow storage system. So who knows how much longer Mauna Loa can go with all this swelling. Um, remember, actually, it's Kilauea Summit, the Mauna Loa Summit, and the Kilauea East Rift Zone. All three of those spots are swelling, are, are uplifting because of increased magma supply to each of those systems from that deep mount mantle plume that is right under the Big Island of Hawaii that feeds those volcanoes and those volcanic eruptions. Here we have the monthly update, and Kilauea is still at normal green. November 7, 2019 is when they put out this update for the month of October. Kilauea volcano is not erupting. Monitoring data continue to show steady rates of seismicity and ground deformation. Low rates of sulfur dioxide emissions. Actually, except for a few days, it was a little bit higher than normal, but it's overall it's pretty low. And only minor geological changes since the end of eruptive activity in September 2018. Monitoring data has shown no significant changes in volcanic activity during September. That is a typo because this is for October. Notice this was posted in November 7th. And whenever it's posted in the next month, the update's supposed to be for the previous month. So they mean October right here, and you'll see as we get forward. Seismic stations detected over 1,600 events, which is an increase of 12% from the previous month. Episodic increases in seismicity seem to have lost their periodicity. In the last swarm, October 13th, see how they're talking about October, was followed by low rates of seismicity at the summit. Sulfur dioxide emission rates are low at the summit and are below detection limits at Pu'uo'o and the lower East Rift Zone. The pond, which is now a lake basically, at the bottom of Halimama, which began forming on July 25th, continues to slowly expand and deepen. Although not currently erupting, areas of persistently elevated ground temperatures and minor release of gases are still found in the vicinity of the 2018 Lower East Rift Zone fissures. These include steam, very small amounts of hydrogen sulfide, and carbon dioxide. These conditions are expected to be long term. Similar conditions following the 1955 eruption continued for years to decades. Now, since early March 2019, GPS stations and tilt meters at the Kilauea summit have recorded deformation consistent with slow magma accumulation within the shallow portion of the Kilauea summit magma system, about one mile below ground level. However, gas measurements have yet to indicate significant shallowing of magma. HVO continues to carefully monitor all data streams. There was an inflationary event near Pu'uo'o that occurred during the end of September through the first week of October. Continuous stations near the cone like Okit, Enpak, and Kamo, along with the K, uh, KALR, a campaign station, experienced an acceleration of motion consistent with source inflation on the rift between Kuo'o'o and Kua... Kupainaha. Kupayanaha, please forgive me if I said that wrong. Further east, GPS stations and tilmeters continue to show motions with consistent with slowed refilling of the deep east rift zone magmatic reservoir in the broad area between Pu'uo'o and Highway 130. Monitoring data does not suggest any imminent change in volcanic hazard. In addition to motion along the east rift zone, the south flank of Kilauea continues to creep towards the sea at elevated rates following the May 4th, 2018, magnitude 6.9, located near Kalapana. HVO continues to carefully monitor all data streams along the East Rift Zone and South Flank for important changes. Again, the South Flank is moving towards the sea, and HVO confirms this, that the whole South section, the South, Southeastern section of Hawaii, that whole South Flank basically is starting to split off of the Hawaii mainland. And it's, that's pretty big, guys. 
But I mean, it, it's it's doing it at a slow rate. Obviously, it's it's very slow. You can't just stand there and watch it split. Obviously, eventually that's going to become a problem unless it slows down. There's no sign of it slowing down right now, but who knows when that'll be. Now, a sample of the water collected from Holly Mau Mau Water Lake by the UAS on October 26th has undergone preliminary analysis. Early results indicate that the sample has a pH of 4.2, moderately acidic in the range of many fruit juices, and high concentrations of dissolved sulfur and magnesium. This composition reflects complex processes including reactions between magmatic gases, groundwater which was recharged as precipitation, and Kilauea's basaltic rocks through which the groundwater flows towards the pond. The water's composition is significantly different from rainwater and is also significantly different from water present in the deep Keller Well about a mile south of Halemaumau. The difference from Keller Well water suggests that the release of magmatic gases is currently focused under the crater and under the ponded water, consistent with long-term observations at the summit. Now results, oh, oh, look at this. I found this very interesting. You know how up there they said SO2 increases at Kilauea are basically null? It's been basically low. Well, they do have an exception that they did post, and I'm very glad they posted this because I was wondering this myself. If much of the SO2 emitted by subsurface magma is being dissolved into the water, current measurements of SO2 emission rates for Kilauea Summit are underestimates for true SO2 release from the magma. So SO2 could be increasing at, I mean, that's not what they're saying, but SO2 very possibly could be increasing at Kilauea, but it's being dissolved into the water, so the measurements above the crater really are not getting the true picture of how much sulfur dioxide is coming from magma that could be possibly rising up into the summit. In the absence of the summit water, SO2 emission rates would likely be higher, perhaps closer to the around 200 TD and emitted prior to the 2008 appearance of the summit lava lake. Future changes in sulfate concentration of the water may indicate changes in SO2 degassing and magma depth. Now, over the past week or two, we did see some spasmodic tremor events, which I will show now. Now, there were some more spasmodic tremor events prior to this time period I'm going to show, but I'm going to show the main ones that occurred over the past week or two. On November 14th, we did see a few spasmodic tremor events. Again, if you don't know what spasmodic tremor is, then go to the description box below and click the link that says, What is spasmodic tremor? Sadly, station TRAD, which is along the slopes of Mauna Loa, which is my favorite station to look at spasmodic tremor from. Sadly, that station has been down for many, many days. Hopefully, they get it fixed soon. So, we'll use the next best station, PPLD, which is actually the closest station on top of these spasmodic tremor events, which occur within the mantle plume and likely show the transport of magma, of massive quantities of magma. And notice here, let's go to the spec. Yep, okay, so we can definitely see this was a strong spasmodic tremor event. Strongest spike only going to about what was it, 1800 amplitude count on here, but the main spasmodic tremor didn't really surpass 500 amplitude count, so it was not the strongest we've ever seen, but it's the strongest that we've seen in a while, guys, in a while. And yeah, so that looks like there are a few earthquakes involved with that. Sometimes spasmodic tremor is more tremor-like, and other times it contains more earthquakes. Down here, we do see another spasmodic tremor event. Let's try to get the whole thing in the picture. There we go. We see another one right here. And overall, the whole spasmodic tremor event itself didn't really go past 200 amplitude count right here. A few spikes going up to 772. So it was, again, was not too strong, but we did see spasmodic tremor yet again. It's not over, guys. Magma is still recharging all those volcanoes on the big island preparing for the next eruption. God knows when that'll be, but, I mean, it's going to be eventually, guys, especially with all this magma that's coming in. Uh, and let's see, we got more spasmodic tremor here. This one's a little more confusing. It was kind of harder to find, but it did show up on multiple surrounding stations, and it was pretty minor, guys. The main tremor only going to about 300 amplitude count. It was pretty minor. But then again, it did show on surrounding stations. And whenever you're looking for spasmodic tremor, always compare it to other stations on the Big Island. Because sometimes these can be surface events. They can look like spasmodic tremor, but they're surface events. So you got to kind of judge with... my The best stations to use would be PPLD here, uh, PLAD near the Mauna Loa Summit, and HUAD, which is near the Hualalai Volcano. I believe that's where it is. Uh, yeah, so use those three stations, and it's all those three stations are spread across the Big Island of Hawaii. So if you see something appear on both those at the same exact time, that's pretty much the same exact event, and it's not surface noise. So that's how you can tell. 
As of the past seven days, magnitude 2.5 and above, as of 6.43 p.m. Pacific Time, uh, November 21st, 2019, we're going to take a look at a few events that occurred recently. Let's go over here. Now, one that sparked interest, which I looked for geology papers on this area up here near uh, uh, the District of Franklin, I believe this area is called, far north of Canada. Uh, there was a strange magnitude 4.2. Look at that. Supposedly a 10 kilometers in depth, but I'm not trusting that depth right now because that's probably because the depth was not constrained due to poor station coverage in this area. But there's a 4.2 out in this location. Let's go to satellite. Very odd location for an earthquake, guys. Very, very, very strange. Don't know why one would even happen out here. I think it was a landslide or something, but the seismic stations do indicate that it definitely was an earthquake definitely was a 4.2 so who knows what was going on out here during this time frame let's go to the event page real quick all right 4.2 again supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth on november 20th 2019 at 1425 utc no people reported feeling it obviously because i don't even think anybody lives in this location uh, i'd be very surprised if anybody does Let's see, the closest station was RES and the CN network, and it took almost 40 seconds for it to arrive on this station. And this was the closest station, guys. So the distance was 2.39 degrees. That's pretty far away. So again, poor station coverage, so likely they were not able to determine the exact depth of this event. But let's take a look at it in the seismic program swarm from this station right here. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with data from uh, RES in the CN network. Dash dash location code because there's none given. Broadband vertical. Since it's a broadband station, I was going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter, but I want to see what this earthquake looks like without it. Okay, not seeing any dominant really low frequency, so let's add that 1 hertz high pass filter just to get rid of those background micro -seisms. Okay, now interestingly enough, which we don't see too often, on the spectrogram you can see the P, the S, and the T wave arrivals. Yes, there are possibly three arrivals. So you can see on Earth Coast, usually it's just a P and an S wave, but sometimes there are tetrary wave, uh, excuse me, tetrary waves. Oh man, say that 10 times fast. Uh, they're called T waves. And we do see clearly right here, we do see the P wave arrival would be right here. The S wave arrival would be right about here. And going forward, this would be the T wave arrival. These are not surface waves. I thought they would be, but they're not. Just recently found out about T waves. So see, I'm still learning, guys. I am still learning. Right here, this is the magnitude 4.2. Does not look like a landslide. It looks like a normal earthquake, but it did last quite long, actually. Uh, let's see, starting at about 1426.21 UTC. And the tail just kept going and going, guys. I mean, look at that. The tail didn't start really diminishing fully until, what, about 1436? So, definitely a long-lasting magnitude 4.2 for up there in Canada, which the District of Franklin, I don't think, ever sees any earthquakes, guys. Very, very strange. And just to put it in perspective, I'm here on the earthquake catalog at USGS.gov, and we do see that there were 109 earthquakes magnitude 4 and above since 1900 reported up here. The earliest being in 1933, a 7.7 .7 in Baffin Bay. My goodness, that's very strange. But in this specific location, guys, earthquakes are not too common. We do see a cluster up here. A cluster right here with a magnitude 6.0 at 31 kilometers in depth in 2017. Very, very intriguing with that one. That I don't remember that one. I was studying earthquakes back then too, just barely, just getting started into it. Don't remember it, but apparently it happened. We have one up here. 4.38, 18 kilometers in depth in 1986. I don't know how they judge the depth cor correctly, though, because the seismic stations around here are very thin, guys. And we have another 4.2 just on the opposite side of Prince Regent, Prince Regent Inlet. My goodness, it's just a tongue twister day for me, I guess. So earthquakes do happen up here, guys, surprisingly. Very, very surprisingly, they do occur up here every now and then. Mainly around magnitude 4 to magnitude 5, but we did see a 7.7 .7 up in this location, guys. Very, very strange. And something that's also pretty weird is we had an earthquake, a magnitude 2.7 at 6.3 kilometers in depth with no felt reports near Casper, Wyoming. Very, very intriguing, guys. Look at this. Um, really, Casper, I believe, is the closest major city somewhat to this area, to the magnitude 2.7. Again, Highly doubt anybody would have felt this. 
It's a small earthquake and plus not many people live by there. But I just thought it was very, very intriguing that this place did see a 2.7, which does not happen too often. Let's take a look at in the seismic program swarm real quick. We're going to go to the event page to see what the closest station is to this earthquake. See what type of earthquake it was. K22A in the N4 network. We're going to use this station. It's only 0.68 degrees away. It took only about 12.9 seconds to reach this station. So we should get a pretty good look at this earthquake. Here we have K22A in the N4 network. 00, zero location code broadband vertical channel. I'm going to do a 1 hertz high pass filter to the 8th power to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. And here, uh, starting at about 702 UTC, we do see the magnitude 2.7 near Casper, Wyoming. Let me just make sure that that was the time. Yep, 702.05. Yep, about, and remember, it took about 12 seconds, so 702.18, which is what we should see about. And that's it right there, guys. P and S wave arrival with the P wave looking stronger than the S wave, which is kind of weird. Usually the S waves are always stronger. But sometimes there are exceptions to that fact. And down here, uh, nope, that's a distant earthquake. Never mind. Thought that was going to be an aftershock. But it's just that one lonely 2.7 near Casper, Wyoming. Not much else is going on. We do see a teleseism right up here. Uh, don't know exactly which earthquake that was. Let's check out the dominant frequencies are between 0.5 hertz and go up to about 2 hertz. So that's a pretty strong teleseism. Let's see what occurred on this day. Notice how the P wave of this teleseism, which it means a signature of a large distant earthquake over a thousand kilometers away from the station in question. We did see it arrive at about 433 UTC on the 20th. And on the 20th, we did see a 6.3 in Mexico at about 427. And that's about how long it would take, about 10 minutes or so, give or take, to reach the stations in Wyoming. And that was right down in this location right there. Now, moving on. I just want to show you guys something in about Washington State. Now, I just want to put a disclaimer out there. I'm not saying a big earthquake is coming for Washington State. I do have a lot of Washington State viewers, and I do live in Bothell, Washington, right smack dab on top of the southern Woodby Island fault zone. So, earthquakes here are all too real to me, especially on July 12th when we got a 4.6 and woke me up out of bed. was not too strong, but again, it did get my blood flowing, and it was pretty exciting to feel. Uh, but yeah, a large rupture of the southern Woodby Island fault zone would be devastating to my family and I here, so I hope it would never happen. So I would never, ever, 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 ever want that. But it is very interesting to see that, I'm going to do magnitude 2 and above, interesting to see how things are progressing here in Washington State, especially in regards to the southern Woodby Island fault zone. Again, I'm not saying anything's coming, I'm just putting it out there that there's some strange things going on. And earthquakes happen in Washington all the time without a major earthquake happening. I mean, we are the second most active state on the continental U.S. for earthquakes, I believe, other than California, obviously. And I think Nevada might come in as a tie since it's right on the corner of Nevada, or excuse me, right on the corner of California. Uh, so we're going to go here. We're going to draw this down. Magnitude 2 and above since October 20th to right now. Let's press search and see where all these earthquakes have been lining up. All right, I want you to notice something. Now, we did have a very strange magnitude 3.5 near the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington, in eastern Washington, which I'll get to in just a second. But this is magnitude 2 and above, and we do see that we had a magnitude 3.2 at 17 kilometers in depth near Fall City, guys. Very, very interesting. Had some aftershocks as well, and I believe it had a few foreshocks too, if I'm correct. Let's see, I only have 2.0 and above, so I might be wrong. Yes, it did. It had a 2.34 shock at 1212 UTC on that same day, a few hours before the 3.2. Notice that 1212 UTC and then 1538 UTC. So it did have a 4 shock associated with it to the west. But notice how we have in the past month have had a few small earthquakes along this area right here. This linear trend that you are seeing is basically the exact same trend as the southern Whidbey Island fault zone. Let me turn on U.S. faults and you will see. Now the thing about this is, when you turn on U.S. faults to USGS right here, they do not show the whole southern Whidbey Island fault zone. If they showed the whole southern Whidbey Island fault, it would extend all the way to here, in the southeastern section of Vancouver Island basically, all the way down here. Yes, it extends past Duval and supposedly connects to the... Oh, it's the Rattlesnake Ridge Fault, I believe it's called, that starts down here and could be a continuation of the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. 
But if you see the new direction, it basically is the same. Now the 4.6 which occurred in July actually occurred right up here along the northeastern uh, ridge right here of the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. This is a way better map. Um, I'll leave a link to this in the description box below. This shows all the faults in the United States. And it's a very, very useful map. Notice how right here it says Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. The many fractures and many, many different parts to this fault area. But you can tell it extends from all the way up here. Notice that. All the way right there. Look, I'll click on this. It'll say Southern Woodby Island Fault. Yeah, see? Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. And it goes all the way down, down near Fall City, which where we had those earthquakes, which is right about here, the recent 3.2. And notice the linear trend right here. Notice how this carries the same direction. Now, um, I mean, the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone does have earthquakes basically probably every month there's a small earthquake that happens. But I just want to put that out there. It's very possible it might be waking up a little bit. It's been over 3,000 years since it's ruptured, and it's capable of a magnitude 7.5 at best. Again, I'm saying I'm hoping that does not happen in my lifetime here, as long as I'm, I've moved from here, because I'm right here. See Bothell? This is where I live, guys. This is right where I live, right smack dab, and there are fault scarps basically in my backyard from the old rupture of the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone 3,000 years ago. So I'm right in the epicenter, basically, guys. And notice how the Southern Woodby Island Fault ends right here and kind of joins the Rattlesnake Mountain Fault Zone right there. And then this goes down. But notice what else joins the Rattlesnake Mountain Fault Zone. The Seattle Fault Zone. Isn't that interesting? So it's almost, uh, what do they call it? Uh, it's almost like a conjuncture of faults, guys. It's a conjugal fault. I believe that's what they call it. Don't hold me to that, but I believe they call it a conjugal fault system where there are multiple faults that meet another fault, especially in kind of this formation, which Ridgecrest was kind of like that. It was kind of a conjugal fault zone where multiple faults failed at the same time, basically. And so, yeah, that's that. So just keep an eye out for that. Now, this article from King 5 News was very interesting. Now, sometimes I do agree with the professionals on things that they say. You know, obviously, they are right about a lot of stuff. But there are some things that they would say that they just should not be able to say. Nine earthquakes to sound region in less than a week. Scientists said that the swarm of earthquakes is not a precursor to a bigger quake. Okay, it might not be. I mean, the odds of a bigger quake happening right now because of these earthquakes is slim. I mean, I, I doubt there is a bigger one coming. But they said that the swarm of earthquakes is not a precursor. It's the beat of oh, the let me pause that. Meaning that they know for a fact is. That is a, that's not an assumption. That's what you know. They're saying is not a precursor to a bigger quake. The PNSN recorded nine small earthquakes from South Kamena Island to the north of Falls City in the last few days. 2.2, 2.6, 3.2, 2.3 earlier on Saturday. Now the cluster of quakes happened in an area where three fault zones come together. The Seattle Fault, Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone, and the Rattlesnake Mountain Fault Zone. These zones are all capable of a magnitude 7 earthquake close to the surface. But Professor Ball, Paul excuse me, Bowden of the PNS said, warned about reading too much into these quakes as thousands of small quakes happen in western Washington each year, most all too small to be felt. Yeah. Now, is it a change from normal behavior? That is the key notion. Is what we are seeing unexpected based on what we are seeing from the past? Bowden asked. Washington is considered the second most active state, blah, 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 blah. And for Bowden and other scientists, this rash of quakes is not considered a precursor for a larger one, though it's always possible a major quake could strike at any time. Specifically, these earthquakes aren't telling us there's a larger earthquake on the way. That is immature. I am sorry. I love PNS and I love the work that they do, but you cannot, you don't know something's a foreshock until the main shock happens. These probably aren't foreshock. They probably are not at all. I'm just putting that out there. I do not believe larger earthquake is coming because of these, but I believe that we should always keep an eye out and not say it's impossible. They're saying that these earthquakes cannot be foreshocks. You, nobody, we don't have the technology. We don't have the know-how to say that affirmatively. So I, it could go either way, guys. I, I was kind of saddened that they were so affirmative in what they were saying when that's not what science is. Science does not understand this yet. In our modern knowledge that we have, we do not understand what force shocks are or how to tell them apart from normal earthquakes. We might be getting a little closer, but we still cannot say, oh, 
This fault has been seeing a few, few some, uh, larger earthquakes recently. Oh, it's not going to rupture. You can't say that. But then again, you can't go out and say that it will rupture. Either way you go, you can't say anything for sure because we don't know. So, I don't know. That's just me. But always be prepared, guys. I'm telling you right now, always be prepared because you never know when an earthquake will hit. I mean, it could happen any day, any second. It could happen 10 minutes from now. And I'll be back in 10 minutes to tell you if the earthquake happened. No. <laughs> All right. So, moving on. So here we are at pnsn.org slash tremor. Now it does look like we are seeing an ETS event in the southern Vancouver Island region. Now our Pacific Northwest here in Washington State, our ETS really was very sad. It was stop and go. It would stop and then go and then stop and then go and then it stopped and then... We saw some, I believe, in southern Oregon, and then now we're seeing this up here. Even the experts at PNSN did say that it is acting kind of strange recently. Now, remember, these are not earthquakes. They are reported tremor. Remember, it says the energy release 1.4, 1.6, 1.5. It is highly unlikely. I'm not saying it's 100% unlikely, but it's highly unlikely anyone will ever feel these because their energy release is pretty small. Maximum going up to, what, 2.2, I think, is the maximum. But instead of jolting and occurring instantly, like an earthquake does, these are tremor events. Remember, remember, a tremor is different from an earthquake. Totally different. I mean, I know the news, whenever they report an earthquake, they say, oh, a 7.1 tremor is stuck. No. No, a tremor is different than an earthquake. Tremor is long-lasting and can last minutes, days, hours. I mean, it can last as long as it wants. But an earthquake is instantaneous and dies down. Now, okay, let's go up and go over here. Let's start with November 3rd to today and press search. The Cascadia subduction zone has been quite busy since November 3rd to today with a minor ETS looks like down in Southern Oregon, Northern California with some a very small uh, tectonic tremor occurring in other locations as well. But the main bulk is now occurring in southern Vancouver Island. Um, let's go to the tremor log real quick to see what they have to say. Again, tremor has been acting very strange over the past year. It has been acting differently than it has, but we only discovered it in 2002. So, yeah. All right, November 15, 2019. I was not going to add anything to this blog. And this is the PNSN scientist, not me. However, it looks like Tremor is going again, this time just north of where it left off back in August. Maybe this is finishing off the standard ETS that seemed to give up back then and will now fill in the missing section up to the middle of Vancouver Island. So far, it has been going on for just over a week, which is the duration I have used as an indication that this is the real thing and not just a small inter-ETS bit of Tremor. Of course, as Wex says, all Tremor represents slow slip in this in some of the area. But those that can be easily recognized from the geodetic motions, which is what you see on GPS stations, are the ones we traditionally call real ETS events. The standard, in the past 14 month one, seems to have been split into three different ones, none of which fall into the standard 14 month version. This whole slow slip thing keeps being interesting and not predictable, predictable, excuse me, but someday we may understand it. Here's the first eight of days of the latest batch colored, color coded by time, excuse me. It started just north of Victoria and seems to be moving up the island just like a good ETS should. I'll give it at least another week to see if it fills the whole expected zone. Started down here and has been heading up here. So that's what we are seeing lately. There is ETS right now in Vancouver Island. And actually, I might put out a small blog post tomorrow showing some seismic plots, if I can find some seismic plots, of this ETS tremor so you guys can actually visualize and see what this tremor is and how it reacts and how it looks on a spectrogram and a seismogram plot, just so that you guys can see that these are not earthquakes. These are tremor. And it's totally different process that's going taking place, guys. So ETS has been acting crazy lately. Let's move on real quick. According to USGS, there is a magnitude 3.5 at 5.9 kilometers in depth at 1648 UTC on November 18, 2019, near the Grand Coulee Dam in eastern Washington. Very, very interesting spot for an earthquake, guys. Very interesting. Let's see how many people, 15 people felt to remember. Not too many people live out here, but there are definitely some inhabitants, that's for sure. Let's see what the closest station was to this earthquake. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go to the PNSN page, make it quick and easy for all of us. 
go here, go to the recent events page right here, and take a look at the seismogram plots of the magnitude 3.5 near Grand Coulee Dam. Which is very interesting, guys. Very, very, very intriguing that they would get a 3.5. Technical data. I am not sure. I'm not good with moment tensors, guys. But, ooh, I don't know. Reverse thrust? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I the pr Pretty much the only motion, uh, excuse me, the only moment tensor I know is the uh, strike slip uh, focal mechanism. And we do see the event right here. A little bit longer lasting than what we would expect. Looking like we did have some T waves there, possibly. Uh, but yeah, it was a very, very odd earthquake for the Grand Coulee Dam region, guys. Very, very strange. They don't get earthquakes in that location too much, especially at 3.5. So we'll just continue to keep an eye on the area. Now, here I am on the Vice site. Now, for all those people out there that don't like Vice, I am one of you. I do not like Vice. I really, really, really do not like Vice at all. But they did have a somewhat okay article, which I saw. The Illuminati. Dun, dun, dun. They don't call themselves the Illuminati, but, you know, they do exist. Uh, moving on. Conspiracy theorists are wreaking havoc during emergencies. Okay, so we're going to go all the way down here. It's probably going to take a second to load. This article, however, does talk down on Dutch Ints, and there, there are some aspects in here that I do agree with and some aspects I don't agree with. I think Dutch Ints, for the most part, is doing it for a good reason, in my opinion. There are some things I don't agree with with Dutch Ints that he says, but there are other things, other parts of his research that I do agree with. So, I think they attacked Dutch Ints, uh, Michael Janitz, uh, Dan Janitz or Janich? I, I forget how you say it. They attacked him a little bit too much, guys. A little... They went a little oddball with that. Uh, let's see here. There was one more thing. One person on YouTube going by Mary Sutton Greeley runs a channel called Mary Greeley News that has over 100,000 subscribers. She describes herself as just an average patriot. Most of her videos focus on earthquake predictions. Um, now, that's not necessarily true. She does not even attempt to predict earthquakes. I mean, I don't agree with Mary Greeley on anything, basically, at all. But she doesn't predict earthquakes. She just looks at the data, basically. I mean, I mean, of course, you know, I have some problems with what she says sometimes, but they're not earthquake predictions. So that was wrong. But they're leavened with a series of claims and other notions about what the government is up to. Knowledge is power the globalists don't want you to have, she wrote on YouTube. Knowledge is power to protect yourself, be prepared for what might be coming and survive the purge of the human race by three-fourths. Blah, 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 blah. This is fringe stuff. Now, this is what kind of got me a little bit, got me going, guys. This is fringe stuff, and for many years, it would have stayed firmly in the most distant jungles of the conspiracy verse. But social media has a way of allowing the fringe to bleed into the mainstream. Occasionally, bogus royal earthquake predictions leak into the public view or are shared by legitimate, legitimate agencies on social media. The Alaska quake wasn't the only recent example. After an enormous quake hit Southern California on July 4th with its epicenter near the town of Ridgecrest in Kern County, the fire department there shared a tweet claiming another earthquake has been predicted within the next 15 minutes in or near Kern County. Huh. Well, it didn't happen in 15 minutes, guys. It happened two days later, but guess what? A bigger earthquake still did happen, so technically they were right, just not with the time limitations. But I just want to focus on this, this fringe stuff. Now, I now if people stop listening, now don't get me wrong, too many people listen to the fringe YouTubers, and, you know, there are some things I agree with that they say and a lot of things that I don't, you know, especially with the professionals. I have things that I agree with with them and things that I don't. I'm basically my own guy basically. But I want to ask you this. If we push all those people away and people stop listening to YouTubers and social media people about earthquakes and and about, you know, volcanic eruptions and stuff like that. Now, what happens if a volcano was approaching an eruption and I said something and it was legit? And I don't, I'm not talking about a few earthquake swarms, tiny bit of SO2. I'm talking about Strong earthquake swarms, magnitude 3s to magnitude 5s, increase in sulfur dioxide, swelling of the ground, I mean, just all of that happening all at once underneath a volcano, then that would be a sign that it's approaching an eruption. If the professionals say it, people would listen, right? But if I would say it, people wouldn't listen to me, right? 
And you guys know I don't go around saying eruption, eruption. Maybe a few times I do jump the gun and say something that could happen. You know, I have said that in the past and I was wrong, you know, and sometimes I do jump the gun a little bit. But I don't go around like all these people saying Yellowstone is about to erupt tomorrow. Oh, my God, we got an earthquake in a week. Likely a 7.0 is going to hit the Southern Woodby Island Fall. No. See, I try to look at the facts as much as I can. And I just want to let you guys know that I'm really not really... I'm not going to say that an eruption's coming. And you can't say that, that an earthquake's coming. I mean, nobody knows that for sure. But I'm not going to say an eruption at a volcano's coming unless I really see the signs. I'm not going to do it. If the ground's not swelling and there's not intense earthquake swarms, well, it doesn't have to be intense. But if there's not swarming, um, sulfur dioxide and swelling of the ground, I'm not going to say an eruption's coming. I'm, I'm simply not. Because there are always signs that precede a volcanic eruption, whether it be a few hours or a few years. Sometimes volcanoes can build up their pressure for years. And other times, they can build up their pressure over a course of a day, guys. I mean, sometimes that happens over the course of a day. And, yeah, because that volcano down, I believe the Colima Volcano, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was called the Colima Volcano down in South America, I believe it was. It's been, it was calm for thousands of years, or hundreds. It was just, it was calm for a long, long time. All of a sudden, in the morning, signs started to appear. There were earthquakes and increase of volcanic gas, but there was no swelling because it didn't have time to swell. By the evening of that same day, it was erupting a huge column into the sky. I mean, a lot of the time, and that's rare, guys. That's very rare for that to happen, but it can happen. However, the signs always appear. The signs appeared with that one, and that was the shortest known uh, volcano that's monitored to erupt. I mean, the shortest warning time interval, basically. I mean, it, it, it just erupted very, very quickly. So that's it right now, guys. Remember, if you want to contact me, please contact me by email, WashingtonMagma at Yahoo.com. Links to my websites and all the stuff I talked about in this video and my email are in the description box below. Please go check out my website. Keep an eye on it because I do post stuff there without posting a video on YouTube. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless and I'll see you later.